Welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman, and I am your host. And today's show is a continuation of the exploration of the opioid epidemic, particularly in New Jersey. So I have two guests today. My first guest is John Brogan. He is a recovering addict, and currently he's affiliated with two, I think, different organizations? Uh, yes, ma'am. Lifeline Recovery Support Services um, and the Ocean County Prosecutor's Office Blue Heart Program. Okay, great. And we're going to talk more about that mm -hmm. because we want people to know what's available to them. My second guest is Joe Coronado, and you are the Ocean County Prosecutor. Thank you, Natasha. Yes, it's a pleasure yeah. to be here today. Thank you for being here. So, uh, you know, I'm delighted that you're here. Uh, not delighted that we have to spend a lot of time talking about this subject, but I want to ask you a little bit about your story of addiction. You grew up in Tom's River, yes, mm -hmm. and how, you know, again, for some people there is some pivotal moment, for other people it's kind of they just slip into a slippery slope. So what got you into full-blown addiction? Uh, w we believe that uh you know, it was kind of always there. Um, the, the the condition was always there. Uh, I, I was it was not unique. I came from a divorced family, grew up in Lavalette during the week, and then Tom's River on the weekends uh, with my father, and um, you know, just confused like a lot of kids, um, and went into the Marine Corps right out of high school, um, and that was really where I had found drinking. And um, the way we like to explain it, as um, I look at it now, is. Once I found drinking, it treated what was wrong with me. All the mm. confusion. Or what you thought was wrong with you. What, yeah, yeah, what I thought was wrong with me. The low self-esteem, the, you know, walking into a room and feeling less than everyone else in the room. And so once I found the drinking um, to start, it really made me feel like I fit in, like I had arrived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, I interviewed someone who's worked, who's, I think, 30 or 40 years in recovery, and he wow. still works. Uh, with addicts and I was saying you know like what's the commonality if there is any and he said you know when we go to sleep at night it's kind of we want to relax mm -hmm. we want to feel good mm -hmm. and he said people want to feel good mm -hmm. and so it's really like the the soothing getting away from mm -hmm. um, and then of course there's that confusion when you're a teenager and you know parents divorced I interviewed uh, this guy who was um, a former white Aryan supremacist who ran a hate line. And he now uh, is part of an organization called Life After Hate. But I said to him, in the midst of all of that, again, confusing childhood and you know, identity, and I said, was there anything anybody could have said to you anywhere along the way that would have been pivotal in you shifting? And he said, no, because what it gave me was so powerful, nothing could beat that, a sense of belonging and identity. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, to fill the void, do I belong? You know, loss of tribe, kind of. So, so now you come back, you've been in the Marines, you love to drink, what then? Um, I, you know, my family was really pushing me um, to join the State Trooper Academy, because mm -hmm. um, that, that would have been a breeze at that point. And I really, I just wanted to, I wanted to smoke pot mm -hmm. and I wanted to hang out in the bars, the Jersey Shore, the summertime, surf. I wanted to kind of let loose because I had felt as though um, I had been, even though I had gone to school while I was in the Marine Corps and I had spent all that time, I, 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 I felt that I missed my college years. Mm. Um, the difference was I was a little bit older now. So, right. you know, it was, uh, so, and it just, that was where the disease and the progression of the disease really caught hold because it was just, there was so much there and I, I, I couldn't, you know, you can't stop once you start. And you didn't see yourself going downhill, or um, did you? I guess I, I, I felt uh, I was hiding out. It's easy to hide out on mm. the island, um, <laughs> you know, with, with my peers. You know, we, in the winter time, you know, the crowds go away. You know, you can fit into the local scene, you can bartend, and you can kind of hide and get away with it. And in the summertime from April when the weather breaks, you know, through October, November, it is party time. The problem is, is, you know, you start to get older and you start to see your peers moving on in your life and, and you're stunted. And that's really where the addiction, you know, crosses the line. So how did you segue from alcohol and pot into full-blown heroin or fentanyl or 
whatever the... Like most kids, um, you know, I, I got into a fight and my parents were trying to get me out of some trouble and I went to detox. Mm -hmm. And uh, you go to detox and you learn about the better drugs. And, um, you know, you... So say a little bit more about that. I, you, Who tells you about those better well, you're, drugs? You're, in, you're mixed in with the crowd. Ah. You know, you're, you're, you're mixed in with the crowd. And you, the ir ironic part about with, with me is I, I didn't, I had learned it and it, and it stores. And that, that's where really you, you go to the addict alcoholic addiction part because normal people wouldn't register, you know, shooting cocaine is going to be fun and then they try it two years later. Right. Um, you know, it kind of would go in and out of your head. And if I wasn't the addict or the alcoholic, I would have I would have gone to that detox, shook it off or, you know, gone to jail for a couple of days and been like, that's really bad. I don't want to go back to that right. place. Problem is we have a forgetter in our brain. And, uh, you know, we, we, we understand that the or we think that the only treatment for our internal condition is that substance. Um, so that's where it really starts to kick in. I, you know, and it was the rocks a set started with the pills. I was introduced after a football injury, playing football, and um, you know, so, some I tore my ACL, and someone gave me some of the blues or the rocks a set and a fentanyl lollipop, and uh, you know, just just like that, it was kind of off the. I didn't even I, I knew nothing about it. I knew I didn't know you could detox from it. I I knew nothing about it, um, but that's that's where it started. Wow! Uh, and I want to get back to more of your story. We seem to have this flying thing on the set. Hopefully, we can ignore it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wants to join the conversation. Um, Joe, so you're the Ocean County prosecutor, and uh, Ocean County has, uh, you know, it shows up in the news as having like one of the highest uh, drug problems and uh, overdose rates. So as a prosecutor, you know, it's very easy for you to just push people into the system, or you can take a look at what do we do about this? So tell me about that. Well, I, I guess the story starts, uh, I became the prosecutor in March of 2013. And within a week um, of becoming a prosecutor, I had eight overdose deaths in seven days, sure. all under the age of 28. I had one young girl, a blonde girl from, from um, Brick, who died, who was 18 years old, died in a motel room, who was doing 50 packs of heroin a day, 25 in the morning and 25 at night. And just being new on the job, uh, I was not only taken back, but almost shell shocked. Like, you know, what did I get myself into? Right. So I started looking at the results. I started looking at. It. So I went back to 2012, and I saw that the, that Ocean County had 56 overdose deaths. And as we progressed to 2013, it was certainly looked like we were going to eclipse that. So um, you know, I gathered my my staff together. I started looking around, and um, you know, as I knew. As we went through October, November, we already had 56 overdose deaths, and unfortunately, in 2013, we end up with 112. So we start take a look at the the legislation that had been passed by the both by the um, by the legislature and by the and signed by the governor, and we turned out Narcan, which was we were the first county to turn out Narcan. We did it. Um, started the training at the end of 2013. So that's something that you give when somebody has overdosed and it can right. bring them out of that. And what we were really looking to do was to save the lives. And right. We already had gone from 56 to 112, and now I was looking just to get my death toll down, saying you know, I have to do something. Yeah. Uh, so um, you know, we realized it was growing, it was developing, and you know, we need to stay on the on the on the on the cutting edge of so to speak as to what to do. So we were the first county in the state to first to use law enforcement to, to use Narcan, and uh, fortunately in 2014 our death toll went down to 101. Um, but the problem wasn't going away. Obviously, that's just a temporary measure. We weren't really right. drilling down on the on breaking the cycle of addiction. Right. We were just looking to, to to control the death rate, so to speak. And, and up uh, until that point, did you have any familiarity with addiction? Uh, absolutely not. I mean, uh, you know, I you know, would read something in the paper. I knew that there, were, there was a problem, but I didn't understand the depth and the magnitude of the problem. Right. It's gonna, only until you're sitting into the seat do you, do you see that. I'm going to go back to you. <laughs> um, you know, uh, it's like, you know, there's this whole distinct sense of, and I've talked about this in my other interviews, if you're not... Uh, addicted to something. I mean, I think we're all addicted to something. 
uh, some things or behaviors or whatever, but a drug and, and uh, you know, that's killing people. Is it possible to understand? And is, because what we do is we start going, oh, they're those people. That's not us. That's not part of our life. Unless, of course, you're in the position where you have to deal with it. But do you have to have been an addict to work recovery? The short answer, no. Mm -hmm. um, we're finding in our family groups, mm -hmm. um, from the, the families that are affected by uh, the individuals suffering from substance use disorder, when we get into the disciplines of recovery, we find out that it's kind of a human condition. Mm -hmm. um, I always, always make the comment about my grandmother uh, before she passed. She was always driving into us, you know, got to go to mass, got to go to mass. And whether you believe in that or not, um, it, the structure of going to mass, mm -hmm. you know, um, and we talk about the family system all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the family, I, I loved my grandparents' generation. There was something to it. They had their problems, mm -hmm. but there was something to it. The breakdown of the family with what we look at every mm -hmm. single day in real time today, 2018, where you have a mother and father that have both overdosed, the grandparents are raising the children. There's no family system there. So um, I do think it's a human condition, um, and, and I always like to go to the old school. Um, they, they had most things right, mm, you know? So yeah. I, I like to make that correlation a lot. Yes, there is a family condition, and you know the families that are coming to our groups are looking for something. They're looking for those disciplines and routines to get into. Right. Um, so you overdosed four times, right? Four times. It wasn't from fentanyl. I, a lot of the time, because of the work we're in and where we're at now, um, I would often, um, I would drink a lot, um, and I hated to be hungover. Um, so in the, 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 one of the last times that I overdosed, I remember I had to be on a shift at Hemingway's in Seaside Heights on a Friday. <coughs> and it was Thirsty Thursdays at used to be's, and you could drink $2 imports mm -hmm. all night. We were drinking, drinking. I think I'd done a little bit of cocaine that night, but mostly drinking and blacked out. Don't remember how I passed out. And I woke up the next morning and um, stole some Xanax from a relative's uh, pill bottle. And I, I wasn't a big benzodiazepine guy. But I didn't like being hung over. So uh, I took the handful of Xanax, which <coughs> with my education now, very, very dangerous. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I'm still drunk. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, right. you know I, I passed out, must have 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm up at 7.30 and uh, I'm on my way out to Philadelphia after taking a handful of Xanax to go cop um, drugs, mm -hmm. heroin, cocaine, mm -hmm. th that mixture. Um, because in Tom's River at that point, it wasn't as prevalent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I hear I'm driving, still intoxicated. Now the benzodiazepines are hitting the system. And then I go in and take a, a, a concoction of cocaine and heroin where I inject it um, in a bathroom at a Burger King right, right in North Philadelphia. Um, and I'm out for the count. So that was the commonality when I overdosed that many times. It was because of the combination. The fentanyl, I, I believe today... Uh, the way that I used, I, I would be dead. Um, there's no doubt about it, I would be dead. Um, so I have a question, and we're going to keep sure, bouncing sure, sure. around because there's so many questions. Um, you overdose four times, and you know, it's interesting. I had read this um, Sam Snodgrass, a PhD, a behavioral pharmacologist and former addict. He said, no one told us that these opioids cause changes in brain structure. Mm -hmm such that they become more important for our survival than food. So when you're overdosing, you almost die. You know, the, the person who's not an addict says, well, why don't, like, wake up. What is it that you thought? Did you ever say, wake up? Did you think you were going to die? There's several things there. So, so overall, um, I, I didn't want to be like that, especially towards the end. Um, I, I didn't want to be living anymore. I was kind of hoping that I wouldn't wake up. Um, I had actually had a suicide attempt after it. You, it's, it. There's no description to the way that you're walking around. It's like you're walking around the earth in a bubble. Everyone's having the time of their life, especially, and I have three daughters, so it was even, it's even compounded with that thought process. And you're in this bubble that you just cannot get out of. Um, I re that that last overdose that we're talking about in the Burger King, I remember uh, they, them, they, they came in um, 
they had uh, must have sprayed me with Narcan. I woke up and my first thought was, did they take my drugs? And they didn't take my drugs. Um, and I wow. pushed right through the paramedics and uh, was out the door on my way, driving <laughs> on my way uh, back. And that goes to Prosecutor Coronado's. Uh, we want to call him St. Joe someday because had he not, um, you know, told all of his officers and made it an order to to perform Narcan, you know, and bring them to the hospital, here I am in North Philadelphia pushing right past the paramedics out the door, and now I'm behind the vehicle driving back to New Jersey. That's the thought process of where I was at. So your thought process is totally messed up. You know, it's interesting. Someone, uh, I read somewhere, it's like, you know, giving up addiction, it's like you are trying to do the hardest thing you've ever had to do in your life when you feel the worst you've ever felt in your life. If you want to give it up. I mean, it's, it's so my treatment. So you didn't even want to give it up. I didn't know that I could. Okay. I had heard all the cliches. I had heard all, But you, you know, didn't believe them? I didn't know that I had the ability to or I was never directed in the manner to to if you do this, this will happen until Okay, I, that's I, I, important, but I want to ask you the same question I ask the um, a white Aryan supremacist. Was there anything anyone could have said or done at any point along the way that would have been effective? It's a tough question. Um, we, I try to apply this discipline with the younger kids that are dying today. The old added cliche, which there's a lot of truth to, which is, um, you know, you really got to hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Today, the kids aren't hitting rock bottom. Yes, there is a lot. You have to be as desperate and willing as the dying can be. We like to say, um, in order for the willingness to really take hold. And I'm going to, I'm going to walk across the road backwards naked. Right. If if that's in what I got to do in the <laughs> snow to get sober. Right. Yeah. That's true. However, you if you can buy into the culture of recovery and sobriety and see mm. that there's a better way of life, we do have success in our programs with that. But it's a culture thing. You have to get them in at a younger age. They, you got to believe on an internal core. When I'm sitting across from one of these young kids, they have they don't see John in the suit. They mm -hmm. see John in the short sleeve shirt with the tattoos. Mm -hmm. So they can buy into that mm. language of the heart, we call it. Yeah. So Joe, I'm going to ask you like, this is somewhat insurmountable. So what is it that you're doing in the prosecutor's office? And this may not be the best question, but to shift that culture, to create that culture where people actually see a possibility. Well, first off, they have to know that it's a, it's a human being. They have to understand, and they also have to say it's a disease. And it's important for law enforcement to understand it's a disease as well as the public to understand. I think that's a, a biggie, mm -hmm. is to change that perception. Absolutely. And that it's somebody's son, it's somebody's daughter, someone's loved one mm. that's being affected here. And I think to, to, to help John out a little bit, you have to understand what opiates do. The opiates go to the brain mm. and attach to the neuroreceptors of the brain. So they're actually changing the brain function. Right. And, and what happens is the body then needs this opiate in there and that even once the once the body becomes acclimated to that particular opiate they want more they need more and they don't feel right unless they do it it's a truly a sickness mm -hmm. so what happens is once you become and you don't realize that you've become addicted to it everybody thinks they're in control of the body because what really happens is that they self-medicate and they learn how to self-medicate and they're going to self-medicate with not only taking the pills then they're going to be taking they're going to be taking the heroin and then they don't know what kind of concoction they're taking anyway when they buy it because they're not buying it from a pharmaceutical company right. when they first start. I mean, most people don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to do heroin. They all start with prescription pills. You have to understand that. And a lot of times they get introduced to some sort of injury or some sort of event that has taken place in their life that they're now prescribed it. And as a result, before you know it, they're overtaken without knowing it. And then what happens, one thing leads to another where now they have an addiction problem, but they all think they can handle it. Mm. And and I, I yeah. think that's all part of the problem as we go through. So, yeah, it's, I think that's that false perception of thinking they can handle it. Yeah, I mean, look, look. At, I don't mean to get on a soapbox, but I will tell you that we train our kids right from day one when they're born that if you're sick, if you're sick, we're going to take you to a doctor. It's going to be some pill that we're going to yeah. be able to give you that's going to make you feel better. And then after a while, we all say to them, "Wait a minute, you know, it says here on the bottle that you have to be 25 pounds or." this age, but you're a big kid or you're a big person and I've been able to take two and you they say, well, you could take two instead of waiting 
one every four hours and before you know it you're training your child you're training yourself that you could take more and then you could say well you know what I have a bad headache but it says I yeah. could take two but I know that I, I don't have to wait the four hours I could take another couple too and we live in a drug culture I mean our, every advertisement is about drugs and and take a pill uh, if, you know to cure everything I was just listening to this series a uh, webinar series called broken brain and they're talking about how uh, the med medical field is behind like a hundred years where now new functional medicine doctors are, uh, you know, operating from the position of you have to look for the underlying causes of the illness. Whereas now one of them said right now we name it, blame it and tame it with medicine. Let me tell you, when you, I, I, I smoked pot and I drank alcoholically and, and like an addict. When I snorted that first Roxa set, that first opiate, and every time after it, we call it the Superman syndrome, I felt like I could solve every single problem in the world. And there was nothing or any, like, and it wasn't, it was, it, you just, it, it took care of every single issue. And the minute you woke up the next day or you passed out, it was, like the four horsemen, you know, yeah. the bewilderment, the terror, the fear. Um, it, it's, it's indescribable. We haven't been trained to be okay with feeling bad. Right. You know? And I think that's part of the issue. I don't know if you heard, I just heard the other day on NPR, New York City is suing eight pharmaceutical, eight to ten pharmaceutical companies for half a billion or whatever it is. They should. Yeah. I know Tom's River is. I know there's several towns in Ocean County. I know the state of New Jersey is doing that now. I mean, when you kind of look at, look at, I'm not here to criticize, and I'm not here to, to, <laughs> I'm not here to, <laughs> to uh, attack. What I'm really looking is to, to is just try to solve the problem, to yes. get out of the, get out of the problem that we're in, and uh, and again, um, what we really need to do is understand first off the problem is a disease. Understand that from the very beginning, and then what we really need to do is to break the cycle of addiction. Um, I believe people have to be held accountable. Yes. So that means that if somebody who does have this illness but has either robbed a store or has held somebody up or has committed a theft, that they need to be accountable for their actions. Right. But that being put aside, I still think that, that it, we're concerned about their life. Yes. And if we can save their life, I think that we should. And what we really want to do is make them viable citizens again yeah. and get them off the addiction, that, the cycle of addiction that they have. Which is what the law really ultimately, ideally should be doing is make them viable citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, but you were saying before the show about how in Ocean County, and you know, when you mentioned like 112 deaths, so 112, you think mm, 112 is not such a big number. But when you think that that 112 are again well, it went everybody's up to 211. somebody's daughter, somebody's sure, son, right. somebody's mother, right. somebody's father, and then all the collateral damage of a child without parents, and then they get put into a system. So that 112 up to 211 is hugely mm -hmm. significant. But you said that last year Ocean County had a 25 percent drop. Well, what happened was is that the numbers, you know, and like I said, in a and uh, 2014 went down to 101. In 2015, because of the fentanyl being in the drug, it went up to 118. In 2016, unfortunately, we had 211 people die from overdoses. Uh, but we put several programs in that I think have made a difference. One is we had Narcan. Then we had the OR program, which means that once they were sprayed and brought to the hospital, that there'd be a recovery coach and there was a mechanism through RWJ Barnabas that they would be able to have a, both a nurse navigator and that they would go into detox and go into, a, into treatment. Um, but then the issue became, well, the only way we're really treating these people were when they overdosed and almost died. Right. So we started a Blue Heart program, which means that you can walk into a police station. That was in 2017. And in 2017, 194 people walked into a police station in Ocean County asking for help, and we helped them. So wow. So uh, that's amazing. So when they walk in and they say, I think I have a problem, what's immediately done? Well, first thing you have to look at is this. 194 people walked into a police station, not walking into a hospital, not walking into a doctor's office for help. How desperate must those people be yes. if they're, yeah. they're going to do that? You take the 194 that walked into the police station and then the OR program addressed 550 people in Ocean County. So approximately 800 people were addressed. Our numbers came down in 2017, so we went down to 163. 
So we went from 211 down to 163, which is a 25% reduction. More importantly, we had sprays or people that we used Narcan 511 times in 2011, but it was only 349 times in 2017. Uh, so you could see that the, spray, well, the sprays yeah. went down also. So I think we're on to something. I mean, I think that this is a trend that we need to look at. I think our programs need to, to, to continue to develop, drill down a little bit more on them, but I think we're on to something. Yeah, you know, uh, I went on the, a line and the CDC, I think it was, there were like 64,000 overdoses last year or the year before. I don't think last year's numbers are fully in. And, uh, you know, one of the things is like 64,000. And I had thought, uh, talked about this on another show, the Vietnam War over 14 years, only 52,000, and I don't want to say only, 52,000 over 14 years, and that left the country reeling to this day. Now we're losing 64,000 a year? Yeah, I actually think it's much higher. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, um, you know, numbers beget numbers. Right. I think it depends on the medical examiners and what it is. For instance, a medical examiner can say the person died from a heart attack. But right. the reason why the person died from a heart attack is that they had so much drugs in their system that the heart couldn't take it anymore. And they put on the they put right. on the they put on the death certificate. It was a heart attack. So uh, there are, there are many different reasons why I'm not so sure the total accuracy of those numbers right. as we go across the entire country. Again, that's but it's just, shocking. It's I mean, shocking. we should and be terrified. The right. numbers are unbelievable when you really look at it. You know, somebody you know uh, you know drives a car off the road, hits a telephone pole. And are they doing the blood analysis? Are they looking behind what mm -hmm. had happened to that individual? Right. And why did that person drive off the road? And bottom line is, is that this is overtaking our society. It really goes right to the, to the family elements, the heart of the family here. And I think that that's why we need to look at this and address it appropriately. Right, mm -hmm. on all levels. So we're going to end uh, this half hour, but I'm hoping you'll stay for the next half hour because I wanna talk about solutions, action plans, who needs to be invited to the table, who's not coming to the table when they should be. Um, so I hope you're willing to stay for that. Great. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us and please stay tuned for part two.